So good. now, so we're broadcasting, so. Hi, everybody. We'll give it a couple more minutes here. Uh, let a few more people get logged in and then we'll get started. So a minute or two more. Good morning, everybody. We might as well get started. Um, just a couple things real quick. Contact information up on the screen for the Tessman Greenhouse reps. So if you need to get a hold of any, get a hold of anybody, there it is. And secondly, we apologize for last week's technical issues. Um, so all of those who registered for the webinar will be given credit for attending. And we're gonna try to um, reschedule that webinar for a later date, we'll let you know. But moving on to today, we have Joanne from Premier Tech Horticulture, and she's gonna teach us about the pros and cons of using slow release fertilizer in the greenhouse. Joanne, I'll stop sharing my screen and okay. you can share yours and the floor is yours. Okay. I believe this is what I wanna hit. And is it being shared there, Steve? I'm showing my side. Uh, you just want me to start uh, from the beginning? Yep, I can see it and just go ahead and start from the beginning. Okay, you're not seeing, you're not seeing the, the other slides. I'm sh my screen is, is, is showing something here a little different, so I just want to make sure we're seeing the same thing. You're I'm not seeing, seeing on the side. I'm seeing your slides on the side, so you got to click on um, start sh slideshow from beginning. Okay, from beginning. Oops, what happened here? There we go. All right, now we're good. I apologize, everybody. We're a little confusion here. Um, okay, my name is Joanne Peary, and I'm with Premier Tech Horticulture. I'm the grower services person. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Marianne Hartman Pickett. She is the sales rep that covers uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the Dakotas. I'm not, I don't believe Mary's, Marianne's on with us today. She had to drop somebody off the airport. But as I say, she handles all the, the uh, sales information, uh, pricing, deliveries, all those kind of goodies uh, as grower services. Uh, what I do is kind of help you out if you have any technical uh, questions or concerns uh, about your mix or even about different things in your growing operation. Uh, fertilizers is, is probably one of the areas I've got a lot of experience in. So that's something kind of my little ballywick when it comes to helping you out, when it comes to water testing or tissue analysis, media analysis, anything like that, uh, that we can do. I was going to talk to a little bit today about uh, the pros and cons of uh, controlled lease fertilizers. So let me go ahead and get started here. Uh, first of all, we talk, start talking about the fertilizers that are primarily used in the greenhouse. Uh, the most uh, Easily available fertilizer are just granular fertilizers. They're just uh, granular forms of different nutrients that can be blended together. 
Uh, some growers use these in their mixes. Most growers do not. I mean, a grower that mixes their own fertile, or soil may incorporate some granular fertilizers in it, but they're primarily used in the ag industry as well as some uh, nursery tree and shrub growers will use it. Very few greenhouse growers use it as their primary fertilizer source, but I just wanted to, uh, to note that that is a, a fertilizer source that people are able to use. Water-soluble fertilizers are probably the most commonly for used fertilizers in the greenhouse industry. And the water solubles uh, are generally uh, crystal-like uh, salts that will dissolve very readily in water and are normally uh, a blend of a to total nutrient package that you need. They're often dyed a blue or a gray, so that you can see the fertilizer when it comes out of your, your hose, and it's, they're easily uh, injected into your irrigation water. Like I say, it's the primary uh, fertilizer source for greenhouses, mostly because there's so many formulations out there that no matter what crop you're growing or the quality of your water or the situation of you, that you've got, you can almost always find a water-soluble fertilizer that uh, can meet your needs. So like I say that's the most common uh, fertilizer source. Then we've got things that are called slow release fertilizers. And these are not what considered a controlled release. They're just a slow release. Basically, they, they dissolve in water, but at a very slow rate, much slower than like your water soluble fertilizers. And these tend to be uh, urea based, like urea formaldehyde, which is uh, commonly called blue chip, uh, which is often incorporated by the soil blenders if they're using a southern pine bark, because a southern pine bark tends to still decompose a little bit in your container. And so they're putting a little bit of urea formaldehyde in that mix, not as a nutrient or nitrogen source for you as the grower, but to counteract some of the nitrogen drawdown you can get from that southern bark as it's decomposing in, in, the, in the container with your crop. Other sources are like a uh, sulfur coated. You see a lot of sulfur coated urea there again. It's just a little bit slower dissolving, uh, but it's just a moisture content. And then uh, IBDU is another uh, uh, urea uh, that's it's a very hard that just slowly dissolves in water. I can say, generally speaking, like I said, they're primarily a single element, primarily urea. There might be some other different uh, uh, coated products or hardened products out there, but most of them are urea-based. Uh, the release is normally based on moisture content in some type of microbial activity, so warmer temperatures, if there's a lot of microbial activity, could have that go a little bit faster. But it's very unpredictable. You don't really know exactly how fast it's going to re release. So generally speaking, it's not a primary source of, uh, of nitrogen for most growers because it's, it's, it's unpredictable as well as the fact it's primarily urea. And most plants uh, would prefer a nitrate or an ammonia-based nitrogen versus urea. And we do see it, though, in a lot of nursery crop growers. And some, some greenhouse growers will add it to, to their mix. But we're, what we're here today to talk about is actually the controlled release fertilizers. A controlled release fertilizer is normally a water soluble fertilizer that's encapsulated in some type of coating. You know, the coating can be a resin base, which is what your Osmocote is, a plastic base, which is what your uh, Nutricote is, and then there's some polymer base that are kind of like your Polyon is a polymer based. There are a lot of different controlled release fertilizers on the market. For the purposes of this presentation, instead of just listing everything out there, I chose the two most commonly used ones, which are Osmocote and Nutricote. I'm not promoting either one of them. Premier is not a manufacturer or a seller of controlled release fertilizers. I just used the two most commonly used in the greenhouse and nursery industry as the examples. But most of my information is, can be used, a generic information that can be applied to some of the other products out there. So that being said, what normally has happened is the water-soluble fertilizers in a little prill or a ball that is then coated with, with whether it's the, with whatever the, that coating is, and uh, it will slowly release over time, primarily based on temperature. So there is some type of control that you can do by controlling the temperature. You can, to a certain degree, control the release of the fertilizer. It's the primary fertilizer source for outdoor uh, growing, whether it's nurseries with trees and shrubs, a lot of growers uh, use it with their outdoor garden mums and, and different uh, perennials where they're growing outside. It's not as used as heavily in the greenhouse itself, but there are growers who don't like to use it in the greenhouse, and that's what we're going to kind of go with here today. So when it comes to selecting, if you're going to be using a controlled release fertilizer in your greenhouse, or even, even if you're outdoor crops, 
you want to look at what is it actually in the fertilizer. Most of them, uh, most of the controlled release fertilizers on the market are a complete fertilizer, meaning it's got your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but also your micronutrients. They don't all have micronutrients, so you definitely want to take a look. If it's going to be your primary source of fertilizer, make sure you've got a, a, a control release fertilizer that has your micronutrients in it. The one thing they most of the micro, uh, control release fertilizers do not have is they normally do not have calcium. So generally speaking, even if you're using a, a across-the-board full uh, control release fertilizer, you may have to go in and add additional calcium if you don't have it in your water. Most of the controlled release fertilizers are, are, are fairly low in phosphorus, although you know, I'd say most of your greenhouse uh, water solubles are also a little bit lower in phosphorus, but that's something you want to make, uh, be aware of as to what the formulations are. The uh, triple 13 and triple 14 historically were the more common uh, controlled release fertilizers in the, that were used in the greenhouse, but we're seeing a trend away from that and going more towards the, the lower phosphorus fertilizers uh, like the 18, 6, 8, 15, 7, 15, you know, 15, 9, 12, primarily because the high phosphorus we see is causing stretching in the greenhouse. One of the other things you need to be aware of with most of your controlled release fertilizers Unlike the coated, like we were talking, the slow release tend to be uh, urea-based. Uh, most of your controlled release tend to be ammonia-based for their nitrogen, meaning they're, they're going to be acid-forming, which generally speaking is not an issue if you've got to find uh, higher alkalinity water, which uh, given who, where, where you folks are located, uh, the uh, Dakotas in Minnesota and Wisconsin, generally speaking, have fairly high alkaline water. So having a, a low, uh, uh, an acid-forming fertilizer is not a, a negative. It's probably a positive. But you definitely want to be aware that they tend to be acid-forming. So you want to, to watch your, your soil pH, especially if you have a low, a medium to low alkalinity in your water. Okay, so how are they released? The primary release mechanism is a combination of, of, of moisture and temperature. How it works is, like I said, that the fertilizers themselves are coated, uh, a water-based fertilizer that's coated. So what ends up happening is over time with the temperatures, those, uh, the prills can expand and contract. As they expand, they'll get little cracks or fissures in there or open up little pores that allow the water to enter into, into the prill and it starts to dissolve the, the fertilizer that's in there. And basically, as the, as the, the fertilizer dissolves, it, it expands and it starts kind of slowly oozing out of the cracks and fissures and little openings in, in that coating. So uh, the warmer it is, generally speaking, the, the, the more the prill will, will expand, allowing more fertilizer to, to uh, exit the, the prill and uh, release faster. So generally speaking, the higher the temperatures, the faster it releases, the colder the temperatures, the slower it releases. So you do need to be uh, aware of, of what your EC is, it is it pretty much at all times. If you're going to be using a controlled release fertilizer, you do want to be checking the ECs of your mix, especially after a, a, a period where we've had some really high temperatures where you believe a lot of the fertilizer has, has, has exited. If your ECs get up a little too high, you're going, probably going to want to do a leach so you don't have any burning happening. Uh, here in the upper Midwest, you can do the exact opposite as well, uh, especially uh, April, early April, where we can have some really warm temperatures, the fertilizer starts to release, and then all of a sudden we get some really cold temperatures, and the prills then uh, aren't releasing as fast. You just kind of want to make sure that uh, your, your EC stay at your desired level so that you don't get too much in there or too little in there. Too much, you'd want to leach out. Uh, too little if you've gotten some really cold temperatures and all of a sudden it's warm and you want the plants to grow, you may have to then supplement with a water-soluble fertilizer to make up for the fact that you don't have anything releasing at that point in time from your controlled release fertilizer. Hey, Joanna, a question just popped up here if I can interrupt. Sure. When you're testing that, what testing method do you recommend using if you have CRF in your media in the greenhouse to monitor oh, your so for your EC, whether you've got this, the CRF ready fertilizer, I personally like the saturated media extract formulation because it doesn't, uh, it isn't impacted by the moisture content of your mix. And how to do a, a saturated media extract? What I do is take a, 
pinch of mix out of multiple containers so you don't destroy any of your crops. So knock them out of the pot. Take a pinch of soil. I normally do it in the middle third. You don't want the very top soil. You don't want the very bottom of the pot up the middle third. Take a pinch or two out of several containers so you're not destroying any plant. I normally try to get about a cup of media, uh, which whatever it is, the, the unit take, whatever unit of mix you get, and mix it two to one. So if you get a, a one cup of media, two cups of distilled water, mix it together, let it sit for 45 minutes to an hour, and then check the EC of that water. Now you want to make sure you're using distilled water, and like I say, I would not let it sit shorter than than uh, than uh, about 30 minutes. But but 30 minutes to an hour is really where you want to go. It's not long enough to cause the all the fertilizer in the prills. Let's say you've got a few prills in there, it's not going to cause that all to release. Although if you do have a lot of prills in there, if you're using that fairly heavy rate, pick out as many of the prills as you can so that you, you're not getting a, a, a false reading there. And then you would check your, your, your EC on that water solution. While you're doing it, it's also a good, good time to check your pH because that's the same way I would recommend you do your pH is the saturated media extract. So if you check that water for pH and EC, and that's going to give you some good information to know whether you need to be uh, fertilizing more or less and also what your pH is in case you've got some pH uh, issues with your soil. You want to make sure your pH is in that uh, 5.8 range, anywhere from 5.6 to 8.2 for most crops, or excuse me, 8.262 for most crops. Does that kind of answer it, Steve? You bet. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, so then we start talking about release times. Uh, Nutricoats, uh, when you look at their label, it'll tell you it's a 40-day, a 7-day, a 110-day, or 140-day. And basically what that is telling you is that at 77 degrees temperature, 80% of the nitrogen will be released in that time period. Osmocote and multicote are a little bit lower temperatures. They are doing the same thing. 80% of the nitrogen will be released, but based on 70 degree temperatures. So uh, if you're looking at uh, in your greenhouse this time of year, you're probably not getting anywhere close to 70 degree temperatures, certainly not at night. Uh, you may be getting a little bit around there during the day, but so it's gonna be slower during, the, in, in, during that cold, colder season. And basically, how those the you know the difference between a 40 day and a 360 day or a two to three month versus a 14 to 16 month is the thickness of that coating. The thicker the coating is, the longer it takes for that fertilizer to release. So uh, thicker coating means slower release. What both uh, what the companies then do is they don't put all the prills in there with the same coating. How you get a product that uh, it lasts, you know. 14 months, they've got a small portion of it that in there that's got a coating that will last three to four months and another portion that will last five to six months and another portion so that it slowly releases over time. And those, the, the thickest coating won't release until towards the end of that, of that growing season or at least or of the time period for that fertilizer. So here we're looking at the temperature and how it, how it, it impacts rele release. You know, if we've got a, a Nutricoat type 140, basically uh, that means that at 77 degrees, it lasts approximately 140 days. But if you look at it when it gets to 95, come the summertime, especially in the greenhouses where those heats can, can really build up, you've dropped it from 140 days down to 92 days. So you're going to have a lot more fertilizer coming in there in a shorter period of time. So you could end up getting some, some excess nutrients in there, uh, so you definitely want to watch it. But then you go back the other direction, 59 degrees or 41 degrees, which isn't unusual, especially for your nighttime temperatures this time of year, you take that 140-day Nutricoat and all of a sudden at 59 degrees, it's lasting 225 days. So in other words, you're getting very, very, very few nutrients being released uh, when, it, when it's relatively cold. And then when you get that down to 41 degrees, it's basically stopped. That fertilizer lasts in there for a full year. So temperature is a big factor. Of, of how this releases, and you ne definitely want to be aware of what your average temperatures are in your greenhouse if you're going to be using a controlled release fertilizer. Okay, so then when it comes to incorporation rates, 
uh, nursery growers because their plants are growing outside, generally speaking, a longer-term crop, not a real sensitive root system, they'll go with some fairly high, high rates. For your greenhouse, especially since you have less control over temperature and watering because the greenhouse can get really hot very quickly, uh, generally speaking, for greenhouse crops, we recommend that you go to a low rate of the controlled release fertilizer and then sub, uh, you know, add a little water soluble if you, if you need to, if the, if the fertilizer isn't releasing as fast as you want it to when the plants are really growing. It can go with the medium rates for some of the heavier feeders that you might have, your petunias, geraniums, mums, especially mums if you're going to be growing them, uh, you know, outside. And, but you definitely want to watch and make sure you leach if the, if the temperatures get high. Uh, for the high rates of, on, the, on the fertilizers, the fertilizers, we do not recommend that you do that in, for any greenhouse crop. The, the, the risk just doesn't, uh, isn't worth it because you can burn a crop so quickly with a high rate, especially if you get some, some warmer temperatures. Uh, a bark-based mix, mix can use a little bit higher rates than a peat-based mix, but there again, still, I think the high rates are too high for most greenhouse crops. So when we start looking at the rates, you know, your rate is going to be based on, on, the, on the, 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 the type. You know, a type 70 day or a three to four month is going to have a lower rate than a type 140 day or eight to nine months. But here you can see we've got the difference between a low rate and a high rate uh, for even the same mix. Like say if we're looking at the 70 rate or 70 day for the, for the Nutricoat, low is two pounds, high is seven and a half pounds for, for the Osmocoat for that particular formulation, three pounds up to 12 pounds. So generally speaking, for most of our crops that we'd be talking about in the greenhouse, we're talking three to six pounds is about all we would want to put into our mix. And, and there again, too, the rate will, will be based on the formulation, not the, just the time. I mean, for the Nutricoat here, you know, an 18% nitrogen formulation versus a 13% nitrogen formulation. To get the same amount of nitrogen, you obviously going to need more of the 13% versus the 18. And, and then the same thing with the Osmocote, the 15 versus 17. The lower rates, uh, not so much, but as you get into the, into the longer term, it definitely makes a difference. You're going to need more fertilizer. So the formulation is going to be uh, uh, of the fertilizer as well as the date time. It's going to be the factors as to determine how much you're going to want to use in your greenhouse. So what most growers do will do a low rate, if, if, if they want to use a controlled release fertilizer, will use a very low rate of the, of the controlled release fertilizer and then a low rate of water-soluble fertilizer. That gives them kind of the best of both worlds. If you've got situations where it's really cloudy, but you, you really want your plants to grow, you can't get in there to feed, but you want to have some fertilizer in there, the controlled release fertilizer keeps it there all the time as well as not getting it so high that you can get burned if you do get, get some, some high temperatures. And then you can always leach with a do a straight water if you feel the control release fertilizer is, is releasing it a little bit too fast. But there again, we're looking at a low rate for both water-soluble and in combination with the control release fertilizer. So then with the pros of using a control release fertilizer, Basically, if you've got crops that are growing outside where you get a lot of raining or if you've got a water issue where you've got very high sodium or some other undesirable in your water and you need to do a, a, a leach on a regular basis with just clear water, by doing having a controlled release in that, in that media, you never completely leach out all your fertilizer. So there's always something there for the plants and avoids that feast and famine that you can get. Um, other growers can't fertilize with, you know, uh, inject fertilizer with every watering, whether it's their injector system, the way they have to move things around between greenhouses and are only able to use their injector to inject a water-soluble fertilizer on a periodic basis by having a low rate of cont controlled release fertilizer in the mix helps that grower to make sure those crops always have some fertilizer available to them. Other growers will actually not incorporate the controlled release fertilizer in their mix, but uh, will top dress with the controlled release fertilizer on some of their larger containers, especially things like hanging baskets or big deco pots. And right before they send them out for sale, we'll do a top dress with the controlled release fertilizer. That doesn't help them so much in the greenhouse, but it makes sure that the homeowner or the end user has some fertilizer applied to that plant each time they water it. And the fertilizer then will dissolve, uh, be released on the surface of the soil and be watered in with each watering. 
trying to say. It also can save some money if you don't want to be tank mixing or you don't have an injector system or you have to move injectors around. It can make it a little bit easier for you. There's no special equipment to have a controlled release fertilizer in there. So you don't need the injectors. And you get less leaching because the fertilizer is only going to release at a certain rate worth of water soluble. You put your water soluble in, in there, especially if you're outside, and you get a drenching rain the next day, you've got no fertilizer left in there where the controlled release fertilizer would not release that quickly. Now, the, the cons of it is that it's very easy to over-apply, and it, with high rates you can burn your crop, especially if you get uh, unexpected warmer temperatures early in the season when your plants, you know, you've just planted your, your, your plugs into your hanging baskets or whatever container it's in, and all of a sudden it gets really hot and that fertilizer releases. Those plants are not very big. They're very delicate. You can get some, some, some burn very, very quickly. There again, same thing in a greenhouse. We can't really control those high temperatures in the daytime. There's a certain amount we can do by rolling up the sides or vents or fans or anything like that, but we, we can get some temperatures in those greenhouses that are very high, and the fertilizer can release much faster than you anticipated. The other thing, too, is that uh, even though the prill is, uh, has all your nutrients, your, your, your MK, MPK and your micronutrients all in the same prill, and it dissolves and it seeps out of that prill, they don't seep out 100% uniform. So towards the end of a crop, especially a little bit longer term crop, you may find that you are low in some nutrients uh, that, that released a little bit earlier or a little bit more readily and they, they get released earlier. Now you're short on those. Uh, you'd have to monitor to make sure that you've got everything you need, especially some of those longer term term crops. The other thing with those prills, like I said, that they're they're a coating, whether it's a resin, actually, uh, Osmocote is actually coated with shellac or varnish, uh, a polymer coating or, or, or uh, some type of other coating. They can be broken and damaged fairly easily, especially in potting machines or mixing machines. If there's uh, augers going through there, you want to make sure that, the, uh, that they don't damage those prills because you break that prill up or slide it across a, a piece of, of, of metal where it just scrapes off that, that coating, now all that fertilizer is available as soon as it gets wet. So you need to make sure that uh, your, your equipment does not damage those prills. So the best way to do that is to check your EC, like we've already discussed, it's checking your EC on a pretty, pretty regular basis. Like I say, it tends to be better for crops outdoors versus indoors mainly because you don't have, especially in the spring and summer, you don't have the drastic temperature changes that you can get. You don't get the temperature changes outside like you can inside the greenhouse. In the greenhouse, it might be 85 degrees outside, but it can easily hit 100 degrees in the greenhouse, and that can just be really hot. If you remember that chart, uh, the fertilizer releases very quickly once it gets above you know, 90 degrees. So here are just some pictures of some, some plants that have gotten... Uh, uh, Damaged because of the over fertilization, you can see they kind of burned up uh, the plants in the in the the left. They're just a little bit stunted because they got a little bit too much uh, fertilizer. The ones on the right, you can see that they actually burned, uh, and the and the plants physically died. And here's some more some pansies where they got just a little bit too much. Uh, this this particular one is Nutricote. You can see the the, uh, the plant on the far left. You can actually see all those pearls in there. That's an awful lot of fertilizer for that poor little pansy plug. And so it just kind of burned them up. He just couldn't handle it. And here's some, it some, uh, looks like, uh, well, it's a geranium and some uh, Gerber daisies again. Tip burn is, is what you're going to see for over-fertilization. That's pretty common for whether you're using a water-soluble fertilizer, a controlled release fertilizer, or you just have high sodium or high salts in your water. This uh, uh, tip burn is, is pretty indicative of a high, high nutrient or high salts in, in, the, in the media. Also, if you tip the pots upside down and look at the roots, chances are on, on these plants you can see a lot of, of a brown or black roots where they've just gotten burned up. So uh, this is the only part where I'm going to talk about a little bit about Premier. Premier, we're, we're uh, the ProMix pot in soil. We will or can incorporate controlled release fertilizers uh, into your into your mix for you if you'd like us to. Uh, our custom blend requires us to to have a minimum order of a full truckload. That, that that's because we have to totally clean out our production line, put your controlled release fertilizer in there, 
make make up your mix and then clean it all out so we don't have controlled release fertilizers in the next person's mix. So basically we require it to be a minimum of one, one full truckload. And we we basically uh, have the avail- ability to put uh, Nutricote, Polyon, Osmocote in there. If there's a particular controlled release fertilizer that's uh, maybe something that's local to you, those will be a case-by-case basis, whether we'll be able to do it, number one, whether we can get uh, the, the product shipped to our plant in Canada, and number two, whether our own in-house testing, that we feel comfortable that what they say on their label and release is something that we can stand by, because we know that once we put it in the mix, it's now ours. So we, we do review any other mixes other, or any other controlled release fertilizers before we put them in to make sure they're up to our quality standards. But Nutricote, Osmocote, Multicoat, Polyon are all ones that we we are pretty comfortable with that we can do. We pretty much will not uh, put anything higher than the medium rate uh, unless we're, there's a real strong reason for us to do it. Generally speaking, we try to stick to the low to medium rate, and there again it depends on the longevity of the of the fertilizer. That's anywhere from three to six pounds per cubic yard. If you do. Uh, want us to to put the mix or the control release fertilizer in our mix? We do make you sign off saying that you understand that uh, the fertilizer is going to start to release, and we want you to use it within 30 days. That you are aware that uh, you can damage the prills, and uh, like I say, we really don't want you using it longer than 30 days. You know, the rule of thumb is that the fertilizer, it, it the moisture content of most mixes. Our mixes are versus anybody else's mixture out there. The mixer is going to come to you at about a 40 to 50 percent moisture content. That fertile, that moisture content is high enough to start the process of the, the fertilizer starting to be released. So, generally speaking, you will actually be able to see within 10 to 14 days of when the mix is, has been manufactured, you'll start to you could start to to read that the the EC is starting to go up. So that's the reason we want you to start to use it as quickly as possible. If you're not able to use it within 30 days, it probably is not a good idea to have it incorporated before you use the mix. At that point, it would probably be better for you to uh, put the control release fertilizer in there as you're planting. The one uh, area where we can deviate from that to a certain degree, and and you folks, because you're up north, uh, are the ones that can take advantage of it, is that if you brought product in this time of year, let's say we made the mix with the controlled release fertilizer in it the first week in January, and we ship it to Fargo, North Dakota, and it shows up there the third week in January, but you're not going to plant up until the second week in February, or excuse me, the second week in March, but it's sitting outside and it's freezing degrees, or freezing outside, th- those those pearls are probably not releasing. I don't know if you remember that slide I showed where it, once it got down to uh, below 40 degrees, it based, you know it lasted a year in there. Basically, once you get below 40 degrees outside it, or in, in, the, in the mix, it pretty much is not releasing at all. So if the product is going to stay below 40 degrees, you're not going to have the issue of it releasing. But once it gets above about 51 degrees, you're going to start having release. So we do want you to use it as quickly as you can. There again, if you're if you get it already pre-mixed, and depending on what your potting machines are, you want to make sure that you're delicate with that, so that you don't uh, break those prills open and accidentally release the fertilizer all at one time. So, what the conclusions are: you can, control release fertilizers are a a viable fertilizer option for the greenhouses, although it's best not to rely on it for your primary or sole uh, fertilizer, but to use it in combination with some water soluble fertilizers. They work very good for any of your crops that you're growing outside where you can't control the rain and it can limit uh, fertilizer applications. So we're talking your most growers, perennials, garden mums, that type of thing, or type of crop. Then also you definitely want to be managing your EC. It's, it's a good, actually it's kind of a good rule of thumb that you should be checking your ECs whether you're using a controlled release fertilizer or not. I like to say, you know, at least we- weekly or every other week, check your EC and your pH. That's just a good thing to know whether your injectors are working correctly, uh, whether you're using the right fertilizer when it comes to uh, what your pH of your media is. If you check it every week or two weeks, you can see the trends. Is your pH going up? Is it going down? Is it staying where it's supposed to be? And then you can start making modifications to your, uh, your, your fertilizer program 
based on those trends before you start seeing uh, nutrient deficiencies or toxicities. And uh, the one thing you always need to be aware of with the controlled release fertilizer, once it's in there, you can't take it out. So you want to be more conservative. Um, unlike a, with a water soluble fertilizer, it's a beautiful week. You can just hit it with 200 parts per million and just go on your merry way. With, with the Osmocote, once it's in there, it's there. Water soluble fertilizer, you hit it with 250, and then all of a sudden you get a cold front. You can go in there and leach it out and not have to worry about there being too much fertilizer. Leaching out the controlled release is going to be a much, much more difficult because it's going to release on a daily basis. And that's what I've got on this. If anybody's got some questions, I know I could say it's kind of quick because it's, it's actually a very small, uh, it's a relatively small topic, but we're seeing more and more growers who are wanting to go with controlled release fertilizer to, to take away some of the, the responsibility of making sure they've got employees out there getting their injectors working, making sure the fertilizer is, uh, is, is uh, mixed correctly, and then also more and more growers are doing things outside, especially during the summer months where they can take advantage of, of Mother Nature versus a greenhouse. So if anybody's got any questions. Nothing, nothing has popped up so, right now. I was, nothing's popped Except up. for the other ones that we had earlier in the talk. So I'm sure okay. something will, right. and, if, and if something pops up, we will um, certainly – um, get those to you. Yeah, but, yeah yes. And, and actually, I should have put on this slide, and I didn't, is, is, is my contact information. If anybody has got any questions, I could say it's, uh, it doesn't have to be about this topic, about anything that with, with our mixes or fertilizers or anything like that. My name is Joanne Peary. Last name is spelled P as in Peter. E as in Eric. E as in Eric. R as in Robert. Y as in yellow. And my telephone number is 360-298-4677. That's my cell. My uh, office number is 800-424-2554, and then it's extension 3. Very good. And I threw our contact information back up there again if you need to get a hold of me or Lisa or Sam. If you've got questions for Joanne, we can always get them to her as well. And thanks a lot, Joanne, for taking the time today. Oh. Uh, good information. All right. Well, I think as always. Yeah. Well, I would think. Well, I thank you for allowing me to give it, and I hope everybody has a wonderful uh, rest of the day and a nice. I was going to say nice weekend, but it's only Thursday. Mm -hmm. But if anybody's got any questions, I'm definitely here. Give very me a good. caller. Yep. And then thank, next. Thank week's, you very much, Steve. You bet. Thanks, Joanne. And then next week's webinar thanks. is going to be. Um, from a company called Blue Lab. They have some new soil testing equipment. So she's going to talk about soil and water testing and then talk a little bit about their new testing equipment. With that, we'll close the webinar. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.